My name is Abby. I'm deeply passionate about all things wild and have made it my mission to document many of the world's most stunning trails, be that through day hikes or multi-day long distance walking. Each route is totally unique. Some traverse exposed moorlands and rugged mountain tops, others pass through bustling market towns and historical cities. They follow world-renowned archaeological discoveries and travel through some of the most tranquil valleys and mystical forests accessible on foot. It's not surprising then that they attract walkers from all over the world, many seeking a challenge, others looking to break free from the monotony of everyday life and be inspired by nature. My reason for hiking though is one of discovery and awareness. Getting outside is now more important than ever before, with obesity rates maintaining record highs and mental health issues affecting over one in four individuals. There are incredible landscapes all around us, but so few of us dare to venture into such seemingly inhospitable lands for fear of failure or becoming lost. Well, I'm here to show you otherwise and inspire you to don your walking boots and spend more time in the wild for the benefit of mental and physical health. I've realised that sometimes you don't have to do something crazy or radical to change how you feel about your life, you just have to walk. I face my own trials with mental ill health, as no doubt you'll see throughout my travels, but alongside building a strong support network, getting outside and taking the time to reconnect with nature has helped me move further along the road of personal discovery. So, here's me inviting you to join me on my adventures as I explore this beautiful planet. There will be challenges along the way, and we're not guaranteed to succeed, but it takes a brave heart and a courageous soul to commit to the unknown. Now all you have to do is decide that you want it more than you are afraid of it. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to Ireland. I've just flown into Cork Airport, that's where I am now. You can see how busy it is, people coming and going, ready to start or end their holidays. And we have got an adventure ahead of us. So we're gonna be walking the Bearer Way. So it's about 205 kilometers or 130 miles around the Bearer Peninsula. So the Ring of Bearer is part of the Wild Atlantic Way. Now I'm here with Hill Walk Tours. So I'm doing this on their itinerary. I'm going to be b and b as opposed to camping. So it's all a little bit different. But my first task is to get to Glen Gareth. Now there is a bus, but it's not till six o'clock. And I just want to get there, get myself settled and sorted for tomorrow when the walk officially begins. So we'll get a taxi, we'll get down to Glen Gareth. It's about an hour and a half away, I think. And uh, we'll begin our walk tomorrow. I just can't wait. I'm so excited. I've never been to Ireland before. Don't understand why I've never been here, but now I'm here, so I'm going to make the most of this. <laughs> okay, Abby, nice to meet nice you. To meet you. Direct, direct. <laughs> That is a day of journeying. I'm well and truly in Ireland now. So I'm at my B&B, this is Island View B&B. So I'm in Glen Gareth and this is my bed for the night. It's not a tent, it's super comfortable. <laughs> Look at this smile. It is so, so lovely here. I think this is gonna be a really wonderful walk. I can't wait to share it with you. And a nice thing about this, actually walking with Hill Walk Tours is I'm not personally using this service, but you can use the luggage transfer service. So you can just take a day pack and have their transfer service take on your pack each day. Um, so you can keep things nice and light and you can really just enjoy the journey. So I'm doing their 11 day challenging trek. Uh, so I'll literally just be, you know, doing the 10 days of walking to, to complete the sort of oval shaped loop. But there's so many amazing things, archaeological sites and historical areas. And we've got islands that we're going to be going on to and nosying around as well. And I don't want to give too much away. I want each day to unravel itself. And to be honest, I don't know a huge amount either. So I'm with you on the whole learning front. It's going to be a wonderful experience. I enjoyed a brew and some biscuits before heading out for a quick look around Glengarry. On my way into the village, I passed by the Eccles Hotel, said to be the oldest purpose-built hotel in Ireland, dating back to 1745. Wow, look at this. Literally a couple hundred metres down from the B&B, and we're here on Bantry Bay. So we're driving along this for a fair stretch today, actually. The sky was blue and the water was glistening, and so many people are out and about on boats or just having picnics on the shore. And sure, it's quite a busy road heading into Glen Gareth, but this is beautiful. So I'm just gonna walk along the shore a little bit further, and then we'll be in the village itself. The village was an attractive place, smaller than I expected, but filled with stores selling traditional Irish gifts. Tourism boomed during the Victorian times, 
And today, though the village is home to just 800 people, this number grows significantly during the summer months. Ah, oh, cool, check this out. So we've got a billboard here that tells us about the Bearer Brefna Way, which is actually the longest uh, footpath in the whole of Ireland. And basically it follows the journey taken, there you go, you can see, look, by Donald O'Sullivan Beer and his thousand supporters in 1603. Now it's actually a pretty harrowing tale as they were all sort of killed off along the journey as they sought to find a place of refuge and actually only 35 individuals actually ended up making it there out of the thousand which is unbelievable really but they were heading for uh, Lendrum Castle 300 kilometers to the north and that's obviously the length of the trail so perhaps that'll be one to come back and walk another day. As the light began to fade I made my way back to the B&B via the Glengareth Harbour it was a sheltered and peaceful spot, surrounded by high, rugged fells and ancient forests. I just couldn't wait to get started on the trail. Woohoo! It's raining, but we're outside. Uh, it's actually quite late now, it's nearly 11 o'clock, but I basically just stayed at the B&B uh, for the morning, just got a little bit of work done, had a really great breakfast, such a beautiful breakfast actually. Uh, I've allowed myself to digest that. Just thought I'd see what the weather would do, but it seems to be getting worse as opposed to better at the moment. But I'm sure that'll change. I'm very optimistic. The sunglasses are the purest sign of optimism. But this is it, we're on the trail. Well, I guess not quite. Let's get to the official start and then we're on the trail. Uh, so today I've got uh, quite a short day actually. Nice little introduction to the Bear Away. It is about 11 miles, 18 kilometers to Adragol. So that's the, the finishing point for today. Here we are then right back on Glengareth Harbour, right next to the busy road. Doesn't really matter what the weather's doing though, it always looks impressive. Finally, there's enough of a clearance in traffic for me to cross the road and reach this. So you see that sign? Bear away with the yellow walking man. That's what we're gonna be following for the entirety of our journey. So this is it, this is the official beginning. It's not a huge deal and it's right at the cross junction of these two busy roads here. But that's because this is a circular route and you can in theory start anywhere you want. So obviously I'm gonna be going clockwise but you could go anti-clockwise and just take on the ring of bearer however works for you even if it's just in parts and you work through it through a number of years, whatever works really. But also, very importantly, can you see just behind the sign? That, my friends, is some blue sky. And I'm hoping I'm gonna be walking towards that. I told you the sunglasses would work. They always do the trick. Anyway, high five the sign. <laughs> can only just reach. <laughs> Off we go. Let the trail begin. Walking out of town, I headed over the Glengareth River. Apparently a popular place to fish for salmon and sea trout. Though, on this occasion, the water level was pretty high and it broken its banks. Apparently, there had been an unprecedented and unusual level of August rainfall in the area, so I steeled myself in expectation of some soggy conditions underfoot. There's the bear away! I'm there. <laughs> Can't go wrong, really. So I've heard good things about the signposting on this trail. I've got 1 to 50 maps with me. I've also got an app that I can use if I need to. Um, but basically I'm interested to sort of see how primarily relying on the signs will turn out. Look at this huge wall of rock here that's been smoothed and weathered over time. It's quite impressive. This is a really pleasant start to the trail, I must admit. We're just walking through these Glengareth forests here. Real sort of mix match of native species like birch and oak and beech. And then there's also non-native species like rhododendron, just casually growing from the forest floor. But it's uh, lovely and whilst there doesn't seem to be too many birds about, I'm pretty sure this is a little bit of a wildlife haven. Whilst eyeing up the glorious blue skies overhead, I spotted something moving in the trees nearby. It was a red squirrel. I just couldn't believe my luck. Bear away, that's what we want. Yellow walking man. And we want these big old gates here. Happy days. So 
Ta-da! <laughs> I'm out of my waterproofs. Woo! That feels so good. I can actually breathe now. I was really like hot and sweaty, but I just literally feel as light as a fairy. Apparently this is a move that fairies do. <laughs> this is a very special place to be walking through. It's great because the sky is blue. Winning. <laughs> the road twisted and turned as it followed the Kumakane River and emerged from the forest to reveal dramatic views over Derry Nafula and to my right, a number of impressive falls tumbling down the mountainside. So we're very close now to the Kuma Kane Visitor Centre. Obviously it's named after the river in this beautiful, beautiful valley. I did not expect this from this walk. I'm completely blown away. Wait, what? <laughs> Danger. Pond contained piranha fish. That is the best sign I've seen this year. <laughs> this looks like the visitor centre. Let's go have a little look. Definitely be a good place to dry out if it's raining, which thankfully it's not. <laughs> the visitor centre was a real treasure to stumble upon. It had a cafe and gift shop, camping facilities, and a lovely garden attracting all sorts of wildlife. So there we go, that was the visitor centre. Really lovely little place. But pretty soon then we should be turning off to begin our centre up the side of the, oh, up the side of the mountain. Here it is, look. Green style with the sign. We're going over that and then we're going up there. Never know whether forwards or backwards is the best idea on these ladder styles. Backwards it is today. Ooh, that was a long way down. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Just about. Whew, here we go. Real trail. <laughs> you can see that there's been quite a load of water coming down here. Blimey. Thankfully not today. Duration, four to five hours walking. Highest point en route, 510 meters. Oh, okay. I have clearly underestimated the length of time this will take today. And the clouds are starting to come in. No worries. <laughs> Woo! Here's a good little climb. Views behind. It's amazing. Feels like something out of The Hobbit. It's just utterly incredible. Just gotta work around this mud, boggy stuff. I could put my gaiters on, I'm just being lazy here. Don't think I need them unless I sink. I can see the path, or I'm presuming it's our path, just winding its way sort of over the ridge there. This just really is not what I expected. I'm completely blown away. I'm really struggling with, with my synonyms today of amazing and spectacular. Like I'm just lost for words, to be honest. They don't quite capture the scale and the magnitude of the beauty here. Yeah, that's quite wet, isn't it? Um, oh gosh, which way do I go? To be fair, my route notes do say about the bog, so I'm not at all surprised. It's just, uh, it actually is boggy, and I kind of thought it might not be. <laughs> clumpy, clumpy. <laughs> Woo! We did it! Bog hopping, 101. <laughs> Just getting views of the Lao. So I don't think I can pronounce it because it has 18 letters in its name. But it's kind of like Eken Ahu Like Again or something like that. You can just see it there. That's what those waterfalls are flowing into. It's just bog, 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 bog. If you don't like bog, this is not the walk for you. <laughs> Never mind. Yes, look, we're not even on the highest point yet. But finally, we've got some views back down over Bantry Bay. It's in the sunshine as well. <laughs> Despite the wet conditions, I knew I was making progress. So 
slowly ticking off the miles as I climbed ever upwards and on towards the mountain pass. I stopped often to cool off using water filtering out of the ground, each time turning to gaze at the magnificent views behind. This looks promising! I can't see any more up! Ah! Oh, wow! Headed down to Tobera Vanaha Loch. They're just snotting everywhere because of the wind. It's like ceaseless. <laughs> I paused for a few moments at the loch, soaking up the tranquil atmosphere and sheltering from the wind. The brief stop helped me regain my focus, and I determined to press on through the bog as positively as possible. Oh, gosh. Look at this. Spectacular, just astonishing landscape. These were the Kaha Mountains that stretched on for miles ahead of me. But perhaps most impressive of all was the Mare's Tail Waterfall, the highest in Ireland and the UK. Oh gosh, I'll be glad to get on some drier ground to be honest. Oh god, oh, and that is why, oh my life, and I'm very careful about my footing, flipping flip, ah, I don't have any change of clothes either, that is demoralising actually, never mind, I actually managed to catch that quite well, I've got my laptop in my bag, I'm carrying it so I can do some work as I go, I do not want to fall on my laptop, <laughs> So slippy. Ah, it's getting worse, not better. It's ridiculous. Don't stay on that rock there. Oh god, that's deep. Oh gosh, look at that. Look, look, the whole thing. Hang on a minute, come back. I need you. Oh my gosh. Okay, rewind. Help. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> clump of grass, clump of grass, clump of grass, stone, stone, oh, puddle, river, <laughs> bog. As the path neared the road, I could feel relief flooding through my body at having made it through the bog. It had been a tough stretch of walking, both physically and mentally. Oh, my gosh. Yes, road, we made it. Joyland! <laughs> oh, that was bananas. Absolutely crazy, but we made it. And what a story we have to tell. What a story my boots have to tell. <laughs> oh. Right, so we're on the tarmac. Need to follow this for a bare stretch and then we turn right and that'll take us all the way to Adrigal. I followed the road for just under two kilometers, passing a standing stone or monolith along the way. These are the most common type of megalithic monument found in Ireland and they vary in size and shape, with some dating right back to the Mesolithic period. Ahead was Hungry Hill, the highest peak in the Kaha range, at 685 metres above sea level. Its flanks were evidently scarred by glacial movement, likely dating back to the last ice age around 10,000 years ago. Uh-oh, blackberry time. Look at these, they're nice and big. Woo! Yeah, not bad at all. Bantry Bay blackberries, very good. More wet ground, unfortunately. The trail doesn't let up. <laughs> I think this is gonna be the main challenge for me if every day is this wet, it's just staying positive about the wetness. <laughs> this is quite cool. Look at these gnarly trees. Wow. Oh, 
Oh my gosh! That <laughs> whoa! Do not let go of anything. <laughs> you see, it's gonna go down. This road that we've actually just emerged onto has got quite a story. So it's known as Healy Pass. And it goes right up through the Kaha Mountains. It also used to be called Kerry Pass. And it was built in the 1840s completely by hand without the use of mechanical machines. And it was used actually as a poor relief project for those struggling during the Great Famine when the potato crop didn't come through here in Ireland. It's just uh, unbelievable how such a road can have so much history. So I'm outside Peg's shop. And basically what I had to do was ring the B&B here, or the lady rang the B&B, she's very kind. It's a really great little store in there actually, they've got all sorts of stuff. Um, because the B&B is quite a few miles away along this busy road, so I just have to wait here 10-15 minutes and then they'll come get me and they'll drop me off here again in the morning, which is fantastic. But oh my life, what a day, real sort of double-edged sort of an experience. Um, but yeah, I feel quite accomplished, I feel really pleased with that. I just want to get my boots off, <laughs> look, at, look at my legs, <laughs> just want to get these off, get cleaned up a little bit and get some food in me and we'll call it a day. And it has been a good day. <laughs> so it's 22 kilometers today. We're going to Castletown Bear, uh, which is Ireland's biggest fishing port actually. So that'll be really exciting to check that out. I'm gonna be staying there for two nights because tomorrow I go across on the ferry thing little boat and explore Bear Island which is quite big actually it looks a little on the map but when you look at the distance to cover with the walk it's actually quite big look at these lobster pots just lining the road here obviously someone's storing them <laughs> they've seen some fair days in the water so we're heading off the country track and we're going this way so we're heading up into the glacial fells that are the Kaha mountains Basically from here to Castletown Bear is 18.5 kilometers. It takes about seven to eight hours walking. And the highest point is 315 meters. Great views of Adrigal Harbor, Bantry Bay and Bear Island. Happy days. Initially, there was no obvious trail to follow as I climbed up into the hills and the ground was once again pretty saturated. However, my attention was more focused on the widening views behind me on the fascinating formations on the side of the mountains. Before long, I picked up a broad track that made for easy walking as it skirted round the edge of Hungry Hill. Ahead was a breathtaking vista over Bear Island to Castletown Bear, and just offshore I spotted a number of salmon farms, once a flourishing industry in the area, though it has declined over the last decade. I'm presuming this is the path, not 100% sure. I know we need to get up there. <laughs> ah, look at that. The trail began to descend down towards Park Lock, one of an estimated 12,000 lakes in the Republic of Ireland. Getting there though, proved to be a little bit more difficult than expected. Do not recommend this. <laughs> Stealth mode next to a barbed wire fence. Ow. Oh, what is that? Oh. Whew. Yes, we have a track. These big old cliffs here, shadowing the path. This is absolutely astonishing. Just the vastness of the shapes on the rocks left by the glaciers. <laughs> I would be kilometers underneath the ice right now. Once again, you could get your wellies out and you wouldn't be too far wrong here. If you can walk in them, it's a good idea. I wanna know what prehistoric people did. How did they keep their feet dry? 
or did they just go bare feet and not worry about it? Because that seems quite sensible to me right now. Bare feet all the way. <laughs> wow, look at this waterfall. Nice. <laughs> It looks kind of crazy looking back over what we've come through. It's just a mass of stone and bog with some nice flowers. <laughs> I followed another track through the soggy and windswept landscape towards Castletown Bear, which I can now clearly see a few miles ahead on Bearhaven Harbour. Aha! Now here is something I've been looking forward to all day. So basically, the archaeological time frame within Ireland spans back to around 7000 BC. There are archaeological sites all over this country, and this here is just one of them. So this is the remains of a wedge tomb. So they were built sort of during the Stone Age, and basically the dead would have been placed sort of in here. So there would have been a capstone, which is that bit there that's fallen off, and basically they're often aligned with the setting sun, which is believed, or archaeologists make inference, that it's to help the, the dead to access the afterlife. But this is marked on the map as a megalithic tomb, and I've been really looking forward to reaching it. It's smaller than I thought, but of course, there's tombs like this all over the country, and they're in varying states of disrepair. Some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller. Kind of depends on the uh, significance of the individual and the amount of time and effort and labor put into building the tomb for them. But yeah, here we are, our first megalithic wedge grave. Very good. <laughs> This looks like a track where it starts or ends. <laughs> Either way, we're joining it. Happy days. It's interesting because obviously we're facing right out into the Atlantic and there is nothing there except, well, until you get to America. But Castletown Bear is well known for being a sheltered spot because obviously there's Bear Island sort of blocking the way. So the western side of Bear Island or the southwestern side anyway, just gets the run to the weather and castle town bear well it's a little bit more sheltered so we'll see what it's like when we get there but already just dropping down the wind is eased and i feel like i can breathe a bit it's nice to sort of be able to hear my own voice and uh look up because i've been like this most of the day never mind it's been a great day's walking hey puppy can i say hello to you Oh, look, it's you! <laughs> oh, you like a rubby belly. My puppy likes a rubby belly as well. Look at that face. Oh, is that nice? Oh, he's very nice. Thank you. <laughs> once part of the original road between Glengariff and Castletown Bear. Here we are on the main road. So I'm pretty sure then the Bear Away goes that way. Uh, we've just joined it and basically gone left. So our next task is to find the B&B. I just want to get my boots off, get my feet airing because they're really rubbing actually, just from being so wet. Uh, every step it's like squidge, squidge, squidge. <laughs> it's quite amusing. I was staying at the Sea Breeze B&B, where I arrived to a family welcome, a pot of tea and a homemade scone. Now you don't get that when you're camping. After stuffing my boots of newspaper, I headed into Castletown Bear itself. It was a busy place with a lively atmosphere, and the high street hosted a number of bars and restaurants selling the town's famous white fish. Perhaps most famous of all is the McCarthy's Bar, a traditional Irish bar established in the 1800s. Next, I nosied around the fishing harbour, passing the National Fisheries College of Ireland and countless vessels yielding nets and other fishing gear. It was a really interesting place. On my way back to the B&B, I checked out the Church of the Sacred Heart, a Roman Catholic building built in the early 1900s. My day exploring Bear Island began with me catching a ferry to the eastern end of the island. 
It was a great ride, with excellent views over Hungry Hill and the lands I had walked through over the last few days. So this is Rerin, which is one of the sort of 10 settlements left here on Bear Island. There used to be over 70. Uh, the population here is now about 220 people, but sort of within the 18th century, um, basically the population was way bigger. It was sort of 2,000 people, 10 times bigger, but it was the Great Famine that really knocked back the population here. So I'm gonna have a quick look around this settlement. It's very small try not to get blown off and then we're going to go right down to the easternmost point and we'll do a little loop there look at some of the military history and then we'll head up over the top and see what else we can find. I headed out of the village passing by Murphy's store and some colourful houses before reaching the headquarters of Fort Bearhaven. It was purpose-built in the 1900s to meet the educational needs of military personnel's families living on the island. Further on, and I entered into a maze of barracks and buildings, all clowing into the island's military background as a treaty port, held onto by the British government for security reasons until 1938, when it was finally given back to Ireland. All of the loose stripes are coming into flower. Oh, sorry, Mr. B. <laughs> really attracting the wildlife, and then. The other striking purple is the heather lining the hedgerows like this. Really, really beautiful. Just really enjoying this quiet stretch of road, heading out to the easternmost point. You can really breathe and it feels wonderful to have a nice light pack today. Just feel like I'm bouncing along. <laughs> Nearing the easternmost point of the island, I found myself on the edge of Lonehort Battery, a military fortification built in 1899 by the Royal Engineers, housing two enormous six-inch guns, a nine-inch gun, and a 15-foot dry moat, meaning it could only be accessed by a small iron bridge. Okay, if I wanted to just walk around the fort and then begin my journey along the other side of the island, then I could go up that style. But we can see here, we have a sign that says the landing port of the French longboat in 1796. So we'll explain that in a minute and we're going this way. Hey look, a beach. Ah, oh, look at all the shells. <laughs> I love shells. Let's find some special ones. Little periwinkle things. Big periwinkle things. Limpets. I'm sure there's probably mussels in here as well somewhere. Wow, there's loads. Okay, I'm going to give myself five minutes. That is it, five minutes, and then we're pressing on. But I think this might actually be the beach where the French longboat, Le Resolute, was driven ashore in 1796. And basically the French Armada were trying to attack the island and island. Uh, and basically it was during one of the worst storms in the whole of the 18th century. And the fleet sat out there for two weeks and then they ended up turning back. So the invasion was a complete failure uh, just because of the stormy, stormy weather. But it did encourage the islanders here and the military to really up their defenses. And that's why we can see so many different forts around here, which of course have been modified throughout the periods of time following that. Now walking west, I left the beach behind, following a small trail that later saw me rejoin the road I had been following earlier. A bit further on, and I noticed a collapsed wedge tomb on the side of the road, much larger than the one I'd passed the day before. I'm really enjoying just being able to walk confidently along on this tarmac and take in the hills around and the shore as well, and the scattering of interesting buildings. We're probably not even a quarter done today and I feel really excited by the potential for the rest of the day. Morning cows! You are right. <laughs> Just climbing up to one of the Martello Towers Used to be four here on Bear Island. Now there's only two. They were completed in 1805 as the British tried to strengthen their defenses against the French. Windy up here, but 
Look at this mind-blowing view behind us. Wow. The towers were probably amongst the earliest to be completed in Ireland, built using masonry rubble. Nearby were the tumbling remains of some barrack buildings designed for two officers and their men. Uh, so time is ticking real quick and I just realised I've forgotten my timetable so I don't know what time the next or the last ferry is back across on the western end so I'm actually going to speed up but we've got to go back into the village now and then we head over high road over the highest point on the island drop down the other side, leave the road and we're going to head to the furthest point to the west then Retracing my steps to Rerin, I once again passed through the village and headed on to the Lawrence Cove Marina, a tranquil spot with bathroom facilities, a gift shop and some rather lovely views. Leaving the marina behind, I continued on along the road before passing a standing stone that overlooked the land rather majestically. Then it was onwards and upwards to the highest point for the day and into the western edge of the island. Ah. We made it! Last highest point for today! At 270 metres above sea level, the highest point housed the crumbling remains of a signal tower, once again built by the British in the early 19th century. There's the lighthouse! Oh, I just ran all that way! trying to catch this 4.30 ferry. I don't think I'm going to make it. But anyway, we're at the westerly most point and this is the lighthouse. At 20 metres tall, the lighthouse sits on the site of a former beacon built in 1850, though the current building dates to 1965. Clearly that sheep can't read. Private property, keep out. He's just hanging out right in there. <laughs> At your own risk, sheep. <laughs> the trail headed through knee-high grass, then joined a track that joined a road leading to the West End Pier, where I made a new friend. Hey, you. Hey. <laughs> this is the best way to end a walk. <laughs> I popped into the Lookout Cafe for a brew whilst I waited for the six o'clock ferry to arrive. It was simply wonderful to sit and watch the boats and waves bob up and down and enjoy the simplicity of life. Right, let's go get a ferry back to Castletown Bear. The ride back to Castletown Bear proved to be a great time for reflection. It had been a wonderful day exploring such a historic and picturesque place and I knew I would sleep well, dreaming of my adventures on Bear Island. It's another windy one. I've waved goodbye into the B&B &B and we are on the road. So I'm heading into Castletown Bear, into the town now, and we'll pick up the route once again. Uh, I'm gonna miss that place. It was really nice, such a friendly, warm atmosphere. Definitely one of the best B&Bs I've ever stayed in, actually. And of course the view, Woo, very good. <laughs> Dursey Island, that's where we were aiming for. Well, we go across the island tomorrow, but this way. <laughs> I left behind the colourful buildings and waving flags of Castletown Bear to head on into the hills, where pretty soon I discovered an amazing archaeological site. So here we are then, in the middle of a stone circle. This is one of many hundreds of stone circles found throughout Ireland. It dates back to around 3000 BC. It's eight metres in diameter and it once had 15 stones, now it has just the 12. For us, we can just come and wander around here and it doesn't necessarily mean a lot, for the, but for the people of the past, this was a very significant place of ritual practice. Something to do with the sky. Archaeologists can only infer, but the entrance, as with many stone circles, aligns with solar and lunar events. Uh, and whilst this was definitely not a day-to-day -day place of activity, it was obviously very, very important to the people that built it. The amount of time and effort and labour that would have been required to get these stones here in this particular spot 
spot must have been absolutely immense. And whilst in some stone circles, archaeologists have found human remains, bodies, um, the, the odd sacrifice or things like that, votives and um, possessions left in the graves, nothing here. And as I say, these are definitely not burial sites. They're definitely something to do with the astronomical forecasting, the weather, the sky, maybe the whole circle of life thing. We can only infer there's no written records, but they certainly make an interesting place to come and wander around in the 21st century. Fantastic views back over the bay and over the mountains that we've walked through across the last few days. Really just catching the light perfectly this morning. I was now entering the Sleeve Miskish Mountains, said to mean the mountains of Malice. Amazingly, there were only four named peaks within the entire range. This is where walking is so great because there is the option to follow the road for the first part of today if the weather was down and it was horrible. But of course, you wouldn't get access to the views like this. Being on foot just transports you into a whole other world. I love it. So this forest that we're walking through is being clear felled and that means where all the trees are gone they've been taken down this is forestry work so that's what they do but you can see they've left loads of dead wood and I often talk about this because it looks quite messy and unsightly but it's completely intentional the dead wood allows succession to happen so you get mosses and lichen growing on the dead wood all the insects and bugs make their home in it and then gradually gradually different plant species will take root and a new forest will establish itself. The trail picked up a quiet country road for a short stretch, passing by a number of crumbling buildings that stood eerily as reminders of life long since past. Bear a bridal way to Alahays. Fantastic. Once again, just here in the mountains, all on my own, completely, completely alone. I'm just loving the solitude uh, and the time with this space on this trail. All you can hear is your own breath and heartbeat and the sound of your steps and your stick, squeak of your pack, the wind in the trees, and that's it, nothing else. My heart rate's coming up. I can't wait to see this whole view as vast and as deep as it is. Oh my life. Look at this. What a fantastic day for a climb up here. Gosh. Leaving the viewpoint behind, the weather suddenly changed with rain pummeling me from all angles. It was pretty torrential Ooh. at times but as quickly as it had started, it passed over, leaving blue skies and clean air in its wake. We are just coming into Alahays now, or at least we're dropping down to the coast. So we don't actually go into the village today. We sort of skirt around, but what is interesting is all around me, I can see the remains and evidence of the copper mining that went on here. There's different mines in the hills. I can see the chimneys sticking out and actually, we're just about to go past one. Here we go. That gives a lot away. <laughs> Copper mining began in the area during the Bronze Age, but reached its peak from 1812 to 1912, when 290,000 tonnes of ore were recorded at having been mined. Mmm. 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 I'm hardly making any progress today. If there's blackberries, walking slows down. <laughs> Cows have got a good spot. I'm not at all jealous. <laughs> We've just reached the road junction that would take us into Alahays if we were going into the village, which is where we will be exploring the day after tomorrow. But today, what we're doing is obviously heading down to Dursey Sound. You can see the sign here, which says 
bear away Dursey. So we're going down to the beach now. So the beach was actually formed with over a hundred thousand tons of shale and rock that came out of the mines here. So it's completely man-made and I'm quite excited to check this out actually because it's a very significant feature in the landscape. The coastline was a stimulating place to walk and brilliantly vibrant in the blazing sunshine. The air was filled with the calls of seabirds and the crashing of waves and I passed by gnarled and jagged rocks eroded and worn by years of exposure. I made sure to savour every step. Whoa! I've only just noticed how the fells over there you can really see the sort of layers of strata the bands that form the mountains themselves gosh that's quite something after a short stretch of road walking the trail then headed up very much up thankfully though the climb wasn't too long and the views behind were hard to beat the route then contoured the hillside amongst heather and gorse with impressive views of dursey sound ahead the final stretch of walking for the day took me along the southern edge of the sound so, as you probably guessed, we're going up there. <laughs> Making good progress up this climb. Feeling strong. Views behind. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, that looks a bit steep. <laughs> we're going up the style, which is more of a ladder. And then just up. <laughs> Okay then, up. The only way is up. <laughs> it was a steady ascent up to 175 metres above sea level, but once again, it was so worth the effort. I just couldn't get enough of the landscape I was walking through, with its uneven terrain crisscrossed by dry stone walls and decorated with brightly coloured villages. It lifted my spirits no end, and I powered up the climb. At the top of the hill, I gained my first views over Dursey Island, separated from the mainland by a narrow strip of water. This was Dursey Sound. Here we go, b and is just up here, so that's it. That brings us to the end of day four on the Bear Away. I can't believe it. Really enjoyed today, feeling so much more positive in my mind and in my body. Now we're just going to head into some shelter, have a drink, get some food and call it a day for tomorrow's day five. And I actually didn't realise I'm walking this in nine days, not ten. So yeah, tomorrow will take us officially halfway through the days. Uh, so today is Dursey Island. I'm actually feeling a bit nervous about the cable car now because um, I'm going over the water. <laughs> But they built the cable car in 1969 because it's a lot safer than going by boat. There's really strong tidal currents. So I should just be thankful that I'm in the air and not on the sea. <laughs> on my way to the cable car station, I passed by a monument remembering the historic event at Calf Rock Lighthouse in 1881. A huge storm destroyed the building leaving six men stranded for 12 days until seven brave fishermen set out from Dursey Island in a rowing boat in an all-out attempt to save the men. Hey, look at this. The old cable car hut thing has been used as a chicken coop. <laughs> That's quite funny. Looks like I just missed that one. It's going back across. But it's interesting because actually this cable car used to be used to ferry sheep and cattle across from the island and to the island. Also, the island itself was once a Viking slave depot. It's where the Vikings kept their Irish slaves till there was enough of them to take over to Scandinavia on a boat. Ah, uh, here we go. So we got some information about the wildlife. So dolphins, sharks and basking sharks, and then the different, oh look, gannets. I've always wanted to see a gannet. This is exciting. We'll keep our eyes open. And just in case you're wondering, New York is 4,950 kilometers away. Hello, may I get a return ticket, please? Yes. Thank you very much. Just me. Just you. I'm alone. <laughs> Thank you. The cable car is Ireland's only cable car and the only one that traverses open seawater in all of Europe. 
It was a steady eight minutes across the sound, and I felt thankful not to be amongst the forceful waves below. Squeeze through the cars. Hello, old friend. All right, so we're headed up over this one, back down, up over the other side, and then back around on the road. That's the plan. Let's go. I can't imagine living somewhere so remote and windswept and rugged. There isn't a single tree on this island and every piece of flora is like not quite even ankle height. But I mean, this place must just get smashed by the weather day after day throughout the year. It must take a real resilience to live here. And of course there's no amenities either. But I can imagine the community spirit is very strong. People help each other out. And to be fair, sometimes that's all you need. Surrounded by unconditional love. <laughs> As I pressed on along the trail, I frequently found myself surrounded by dry stone walls, covered in moss and lichen and gorse. Apparently, there's an estimated 400,000 kilometres of dry stone walls in Ireland alone, the oldest of which is said to be 5,800 years old. And so begins the climb up to the highest point on the island, 305 metres above sea level. And there's a signal tower on the top, but we'll have a chat about that when we get there. Whew, let's get out of the wind a little bit and shelter in here. So the whole signal tower was built around 200 years ago, once again part of the British defence system against the French invasion and this is all that is left today. Just some crumbling walls that probably I shouldn't be stood in and some metal box thing. <laughs> Don't know what that used to contain. But this is such an exposed location so obviously they want to be up high, they want to be able to see out far but it does mean you are so susceptible to getting bashed by the weather as it comes in wave after wave after wave of weather front hence how in just 200 years this has crumbled so much okie dokie so we're dropping down to this track which is going to go past the last building on the island i just can't get over what life must be like living here i'm just a bit speechless to be honest anyway and then we're going to head right on to jersey head so the furthest point possible on land until we reach the sea and then it's a long old swim to America. As I drew closer to Dursey Head, I rather unexpectedly found myself feeling uneasy and vulnerable at being so exposed to the weather and the waves and insecure as I stood in the middle of a timeless land. At the same time though, it was a humbling experience to realise my insignificance as I looked out towards the sea. I didn't dwell there for too long though, soon turning heel and joining the track that ran along the eastern edge of the island. It was lined with abandoned and decaying buildings that added to the starkness of the place. I know that the best place for me to have seen whales or dolphins was right at Dursey Head uh, and I didn't go there but I'm still keeping my eye open just looking into the sea see if I can see any movement that doesn't tie in with the waves. <laughs> Trouble is I keep tripping up because I'm looking down there and not where I'm putting my feet. But thankfully this is a big path and well, hopefully I'd stop if I started falling down there. <laughs> hopefully. Heading through the first of the two main sort of little settlement places along this road slash track. There's just nobody about, it's just deserted. It's got a strange feel to it and the only cars there are are just rusting and decaying. I didn't realise it at the time, but there are now only four permanent residents on the island and most of the buildings still standing are holiday houses available to rent. Look how the gorse is just bursting into flame as the sun comes out. It catches it so vibrantly. Really beautiful flowers. Nearby the cable car station and the end of my walk, 
I noticed the remains of a monastic church and graveyard is said to have Franciscan ancestry and likely dates back to the early 16th century. Here we are then, right back where we started. That is our loop of Dursley Island complete. <laughs> Right, we are back on the other side. Cable car is just going back. So let's finish this loop then. So heading off along the shoreline. And guess what? Over a style. <laughs> the path followed a narrow trail up to 151 meters above sea level, which unsurprisingly offered immense views all around. Made it. Heading down the side of the hill, I ducked into a little cove with just one thing on my mind, rock pooling. I'm on a beach, I'm looking for rock pools, and then I'm gonna be looking for crabs. That one looks a little bit small, and this is the only other one. It's big enough. For half an hour, I completely lost myself in the underwater world, filled with crabs, shrimps, and tiny fish. I marvelled at the colours of the sand and the shells, until I spotted a hermit crab. Look at this. So, you see he's just inside of his shell right now, but if we give him a couple of minutes, he'll come out. Just you watch. So there we go, I'm on the main road now. It's not much bigger than the not main road, um, but this will take us back to the B&B. So that's it, day five, done. So four days left. Can't believe it really, it's gone so quickly. There we go. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Waving goodbye to this secluded spot on the peninsula. It's been quite a fun couple of days just exploring, but now we are on to our final few days, longer days, longer mileage, but that just means more time immersed in this wonderful landscape. Here we go, back at style, back on the track. Woo. Let's go. Come on, son, you can do it. I believe in you. Burn. Burn through the clouds, son. Spend a lot of the time on the trail talking to myself and <laughs> quite comfortably. But the funny thing is, is when like I go past somebody and they're like, who are you talking to? I'm like, me, <laughs> just just me. Me, myself and I, you know, we have a good time hanging out. It's good, good space. So I recognize this. This is Bally Donegan Beach. We passed by a couple of days ago, man-made beach here. Doesn't seem to be a single human in sight, but the seagulls seem to be having a good time. <laughs> Entering into Alahees, I went to check out the Copper Mine Museum, which covers all aspects of the history of copper mining in the area, from prehistoric times to the Industrial Revolution. The displays and collections had me transfixed, but it was deeply saddening to read the extensive list of those who had lost their lives in the mines. It was an unbelievably risky and dangerous job. So that is the Copper Museum. So we're gonna head through town now and then out the other side into the hills. Cloud is really coming down the mountain over there. Just keeping an eye on it. The village itself was a colorful place, though the dark skies and lack of activity saw me pass through rather quickly. And I soon found myself climbing into the hills surrounding the settlement. So maybe this was one of the miners commuting paths, traveling up into the hills to get to the engines that would take them down underground for hours and hours of hard and dangerous work. Who knows, but it can't have been a fun feeling climbing up, knowing where you're going. Here's the quarry itself, look, the remains of the hills scarred by the work of man. It's just a jumble now, isn't it? Look at that. This must have been such a dismal place to work, honestly. So exposed and industrial. And imagine this, 
you wake up and this is your commute to work down there. That is not an appealing prospect. Understatement of the year. Wow, look at this road, right up through the mountains. Ominous looking stone, so jagged and jarred, doesn't look inviting, but we're going there anyway. As I've been walking along the last few days, I've been practicing my tin whistle skills. So I had to bring it to Ireland. This is the home country of Celtic music, Irish jigs, that sort of thing. Um, I'm really not very good, but uh, I used to play when I was younger quite obsessively and I've just been trying to see if I can remember some of the jigs that I knew and I can literally remember like parts of ones. So I thought if we find a nice clear spot in the next few days, I'll sit down and bring you up to speed with my skills. It'd be quite fun playing a tin whistle whilst I'm in Ireland. So you've got that to look forward to. You better stick around because I've been practicing hard. <laughs> I was in good spirits, feeling high on life despite the gray weather. But just minutes later, everything changed. Instant change of situation. Come across this collie. I don't know where its people are. It's just tucked away here in the bushes, tied up. There is nobody at all in this area. It looks like she's been there for a while. She's really wet. Poppy, I am not leaving you. Don't worry. I'm not going anywhere. We'll sort this out. We'll sort this out. I'll ring some people and see what I can do, okay? Oh, look at you. Right, I've made a few calls and I'm just waiting to hear back from Hill Walk Tours. They're going to see if they can ring an animal shelter um, and just see if we can get some help because I'm not leaving this dog. Uh, he, she, absolutely soaked, really, really cold. We're going to make a plan. As the rain grew heavier, the dog began shivering okay. violently. So we cuddled up until we had a forward plan. They have advised that sometimes it can be very normal for farmers, our locals, to leave their dog for a while and we'll come back for it. But I don't know. It would be better if we can find out for sure. Are there any houses in the vicinity at all? Sometimes locals will know who dog it is and you could call in and ask. Okay, let's go find this farm. I'll be back, puppy. Either way, we'll make a plan. So you see there's a house just down there, the farms. Got to find one of these tracks to get through. I followed a track heading down to a farm some way away and was walking as quickly as I could, when behind I noticed a tractor driving up the trail I had just left behind. Yes, I can see the tractor's gone into the quarry. That's it, the dog's got people. I think it's best I get out of here. I'm creating a bit of a scene being off a public right of way. The trouble with collies is you get hair everywhere. I've just been pulling hair out of my mouth <laughs> all the way down the hill. And no, I did not lick the dog. <laughs> Got a split here, so I could go that way, but I want to stay on the old copper road, which I'm on. So we're going to go this way, just basically hugging the base of the mountain and the trail itself kind of contours it as well, goes over the top a little bit. So this really is not a bad place to be, a nice firm surface in the pouring rain. Here's the trail, back on the bear away. Woo! Oh wow, literally 50 meters on, and there's this massive standing stone here overlooking the shore, just casually in their front garden. <laughs> uh, you can always tell if the weather's bad, by the way, folks. This is the best type of weather forecasting if I don't have my hat on. If I've got my hat on, generally the weather's okay, it's manageable, we can work with it. But if the hat goes away, which it's about to, then it's wet. Right, hat away. Up we go, over the river. I'm gonna take a guess and call this the River Iries. That may or may not be true. The weather gradually got worse as the winds intensified and the rain grew heavier. 
I walked along Irie Strand, which felt exposed and desolate in the wet conditions, though it was amazing to see the force of the waves against the rocks and the shoreline. I just made sure I didn't get too close. So we'll come back down here tomorrow morning and pick up the trail to continue for the next day. So let's go. Onwards and upwards. Woo! Can see the town there, multicolored buildings just standing out from the mist. And that's where we're going. Colourful land. I'm gonna just quickly head to the village store, just wanna get some food. I haven't actually eaten anything since breakfast, so it's nearly five o'clock. So what time did I have breakfast? Quarter to eight. So I'm just on the edge of getting a bit hungry now. So I keep saying so. Get some food. I was like, I need my brain to work. <laughs> and then we'll find a B and B. Colourful houses. Yay! Look at this. Can't help but feel joyful. <laughs> We're back outside. And don't look at what's in my hand. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> I went in there for fruit. How have I come out with a scone? Ugh, honestly, backpacking's dangerous. Iris proved to be a vibrant and upbeat place, even in the rain. I would have liked to have spent more time looking round, but I made a dash for the B&B &B as the rain grew heavier still, passing a sensory garden and lots of inviting cafes along the way. Ah, hello. I'm a bit soggy. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> nice to meet you. Oh, you all right? No. Oh, this is the life. So I'm inside. I'm dry. Everything is drying out. I've been downstairs, had a really nice cup of tea. Great chat with the wonderful owners here. And I've just been completely honest with them. I said, I can't relax about this dog. I need to know that it's not still on the mountainside. Um, so they've rung around and they've got hold of the dog wardens and they're going to come here in half an hour or so. They'll pick me up and we're going to go up um, and check if the dog is still there. Hiya. Hi, how are you? Very well, are you? I'm good. Good. And the dog was there, the rope's gone, so... The dog is gone? Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. It's gone. Okay, the dog is gone. The rope's still there, but the dog's gone. Uh, I guess that's kind of good news, but I feel a bit confused, I guess. After showing the warden a picture of the dog, he managed to track down the owner, whose story didn't match mine. I don't believe the man set out to hurt the dog, just as is the case all over the world. Some farmers treat dogs differently. He was given a warning after assuring us the dog was fed, warm and dry, and I was told he would be monitored and prosecuted if anything else came up. I felt unbelievably grateful that the situation was taken seriously. I was respected and listened to, and I went to sleep that night feeling won over, not only by Ireland's landscape, but by its kind and caring people as well. Morning, morning. Really lovely stay at that b and so It just felt so homely. Very safe, kind, loving atmosphere. Uh, I wish I was staying there for a couple more days, but never mind, we're on the road. That's what we do best is just keep moving. Uh, so heading into Iris again. Um, colors are a little bit more vibrant today on the houses because it's not pouring down, but it's still not a perfect day. But we'll take this, it's dry at least. Um, so today we've got a longer day, we're heading right through to Larach, so a bit of uh, coastal path walking, a bit of road walking, I think a few miles through the hills, I'm not sure, we'll just have to wait and see really, one foot in front of the other, let's take it on, I think it's about 27 kilometres or something, so not too bad at all. Hey look, strawberry plants, <laughs> a little bit out of season, and then just down here, a little stream. On my way out of the village, I dropped into the St Kentigern's church, famous for its exceptional stained glass windows, and, true to the stories I had heard, it was an unbelievably uplifting place to stand in. Now you see me. Now you don't. 
Haha, <laughs> 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 check these out. The shells that are all stuck into the wall. It's very clever. <laughs> all the way along, look. That's a lot of shells. This sacred spot of the Emerald Isle welcomes all who enter here. May the sun shine on your path. May you live your life without fear. May you care for all God's jewels on land and in the sea. Sit here a while and reflect on this world of eternity. God bless all who enter here for peace. You will truly find that may that peace go with you forevermore and wherever your paths may wind. Joining the coastal path once again, I noticed the desolate looking ruins of the old Coast Guard station. It was built by the British government, but later attacked and burned in 1920 by a local IRA guerrilla force who had heard that a stash of rifles were kept there. If it wasn't for these signs, I would have no idea where I'm going right now. <laughs> oh, perhaps I should have just stuck to the road. It's pretty wet. <laughs> Never mind. No going back now. Ah, tarmac. This might be the road that we left earlier. We're back on it, just with newly wet feet. <laughs> so, Ard Groom that way, or Ard Groom that way? Well, we're going this way, following the Ring of Bearer. Got this sign here, which says the Ogham Stone. So basically, these are tall stones found throughout Ireland and other islands around the area with basically the Irish alphabet on them. They're really, really interesting. Uh, this one on my route note says that you can't actually see it, that the owner has blocked it off. Although there is a sign, so that may have changed. Um, but essentially, that would be that way. If I wanted to go and look at that, I'm going to carry on because I don't want to walk down there and find that I can't see it. The path followed a road alongside Kulach Bay and for a short walk, I enjoyed the coastal views before turning north and inland. We are on a path now, headed to the southern shore of Fada Lake. It's really boggy. <laughs> um, everywhere just looks so drab in this overcast light, but I know that if the sun does come out, it'll come to life quite quickly. Um, oh, frick, nope, <laughs> that was deep. Ah! <laughs> okay, uh, let's go this way. Oh, this looks okay. There we go, three, two, one. <laughs> <Ugh. laughs> it's been refreshing because I've been able to sort of take some time to reflect on my mindset. Um, take the first day, for example, you know, I was struggling with the weight on my back. It was so boggy. I was not mentally prepared for this trip at all because I just got off another trail and that was the complete contrast to this. Um, it was very, very different and it was a quick turn around to this trail. I've come out the other side these last couple of days and as I say, just sort of looking at my mindset and how things have been and how today really is very wet. <laughs> very wet, very boggy, uh, stinky, but I'm having the time of my life and I think, you know, that mental resilience, that bounce back, whatever it is that's caused me to feel more myself today. Uh, it's just wonderful because I can actually access the landscapes that I'm in. I don't need to be like, that is a great mountain. I can be like, that is a great mountain. I'm in this beautiful, beautiful part of the world. I've just come from some stunning coastline to some wonderful fells and mountains, ruggedness all around this wild landscape. And I get to walk through it, which is incredible. So. I'm gonna keep sort of checking in with my mindset and keep challenging the negative and difficult thoughts because there is always something around the corner that can flip it right on its head. And I'm always trying to grab hold of those things, those things that open my eyes, open my heart and transport me into the person that I long to be. I might not get to be that person all the time. I might not get to be fully me all of the time. But if I stay open to that journey, as always, then there's something to come away with it. And once again, on this trail, it has taught me something. I've been struggling the last few days to be like, what am I learning from this experience? But now I really see it. It's all about that mindset, staying aware of it and trying to just 
let it do what it does, but keep guiding it back to where you want it to be. Here we go, Ardgroom. Ardgroom actually gets its name from uh, the Irish word meaning two drumlins, and drumlins are basically sort of elongated hills formed by glaciers tens of thousands of years ago. And obviously, there's uh, quite a few hills around here, and there must be two either side, maybe. But we're also getting close to the Kenmare estuary, and tomorrow we're actually going up to Kenmare, so it's another long day. But as I mentioned, this is about the halfway point for our walk today. We've got about eight and a half miles to go until we get to Larish. Ardgroom lies to the northwest of Glenbeg Loch, a freshwater lake that attracts thousands of visitors each year. The village itself once again boasted uplifting colours and attention to detail, with a shop, post office, petrol station, and the village inn. It's amazing. I keep getting little glimpses of Kenmare Bay, which is a bay on the northern part of the Barrow Peninsula, obviously because we're working our way round. But it's so exciting as the landscape's changing. It's just showing that we're making progress through and along this ring of bearer. I don't know if you can see this sign, but it says Adragroom Stone Circle. I didn't know there was a stone circle around here, but it's up that way anyway, not sure how far. Joining the road again. So we're leaving our little one. This is the main road. It's not hugely busy though. Following the road proved to be an absorbing walk, and I lost myself in finding as many wildflowers as possible in the verges. There was loosestrife, heather, thrift and vetch, gorse, rhododendron and more. Oh yeah, I forgot this happens today. We're leaving County Cork and entering County Kerry. There's the sign, let's cross the county line. And now I'm in County Kerry. New territory, let's do this thing. Woohoo, we made it. 1.6 kilometers along the road and we're out of style. This is the junction. So we're heading up into the mountains. It's probably gonna be boggy. It's probably gonna be rocky. It's probably gonna be windy, but we can deal with all these things. Goodbye to the cars. i will be glad to get rid of them. All right, let's go. The view is opening out towards the bay, even in this murky, murky weather. Still looks amazing. Ah, there we go. Look at that. See right into the bay there. Whew. And the rocks ahead of us on the mountainside, undoubtedly scraped by glaciers to form those sort of linear patterns. So, so fascinating to see this history right there in front of us, the shaping and making of this land. Nice, look at that. Beautiful. A short while on, and I found myself walking alongside the Kashalkiti stone circle. It's made up of a row of stones and an altar stone at each end, which faces the sunrise and sunset at the equinox. Then, just a mile or so later, I discovered the most beautiful waterfall, tumbling unexpectedly down a rock face. The sight took me completely by surprise, and I was mesmerised by the throffing water, a magical feel to the place. Uh, let's try. Oh, flip, once again, too deep. All right, let's go rock to rock. Sounds like some kind of band. I'm gonna go see the rock to rocks this weekend. Okay, ready? One, <laughs> two, <laughs> three. <laughs> <gasps> oh no! Oh no! No! How am I supposed to get that? Oh. <laughs> it sank and I just ran. Okay, I'm coming for you, stick. Don't worry about it. It's gonna be okay. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> Scalliver! Oh. I can't, it's stuck! Oh. Oh, no! Oh. Okay. Oh. Ah, oh. ah, oh. 
That's a bit of an ordeal. Right, climb the ladder, go. Escape this boggy, dismal place. <laughs> Through the tunnel into another world. <laughs> I can't believe this. Look, we're just in this like mangrove of rhododendron. It's kind of really weird. Coming from the mall to this jungle. Look at this, glorious sunshine and mountains all around. Perfect way to be spending the day, perfect place to be walking through. It's really amazing watching the cloud burning off. It's slowly disappearing, the peaks are coming through and the sun is triumphing over the darkness. That's what we like to see. Heading over the Kronshug Bridge. This looks quite old. Wow, big river, biggest yet, look at that. I've come across this forge here, Blacksmith's Forge. It's shut, unfortunately, but uh, Blacksmith's Forge is a special place in my heart. I really, really enjoy blacksmithing, and I always say, if this whole filming thing doesn't work out, then I'll go become a blacksmith somewhere in the woods. <laughs> But um, I did a course a couple years ago for my birthday making different blades and a blacksmith's knife is quite sort of thin and it's got like a swirl on the end and basically in the forge the swirl came off so I made the necklace out of it. People always think it's like a shepherd's thing or some kind of symbol but it's literally just my knife went wrong, it fell apart so I made a necklace out of it. <laughs> but there we go, we found a forge, let's go find a B&B. &B. b and B's just ahead. My goodness me, this is such a lovely place. It's just absolutely silent, side for the wind. I can really breathe here, it feels very, very peaceful. <laughs> Toodle! <laughs> oh, I'm setting them off now. <laughs> you're all right. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> Hiya, Hi, you all right? <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. So we're leaving this peaceful, tranquil valley behind with the B&B &B, and we're heading on to the trail. It's our penultimate day today. We've got 24 kilometers once I get back to the trail, all the way to Kenmare, which is indeed a town, biggest place on the trail so far. I headed out along a quiet road to begin climbing back up into the mountains. Along the way, passing a sign to Durin Gardens, planted in the early 20th century and famous for its subtropical feel. The cloud actually appears to be coming in as opposed to dissipating. I keep looking behind. The views are fantastic, but yeah, the cloud's definitely a lot lower than it was when I left. So we'll keep an eye on that. So we got Nokka Nugga Tea, or whatever it's called, up there, and then Nokka Tea up there. So they're the two peaks that we've kind of come in between, sort of three, four hundred meters in height each of them. But it's such a, a rugged and barren landscape. And it's interesting because when I first emerged into this kind of scenery on the Barrow Way, I was like, hmm, it's quite bleak. But the more time you spend in it, the more you realize actually it's really quite characterful. Uh, the rocks, you know, each of them weathered and sort of scarred in their own way from the hundreds and thousands of years that they've been immersed in this landscape. They're all gnarled up and covered in lichen as well, so some of them are quite colourful. And then you have all the different grasses and the occasional wildflowers, here we go, that grow on the verges and in amongst the bog and the wetness underfoot. It is quite an interesting landscape and of course the summits themselves, they're really quite stark and harsh, the rocks reaching heavenward. But there's something quite transformative about looking at them. It takes you back to times long gone and you almost feel immersed in prehistory. Morning! 
Oh, he's so cute. <laughs> Here's a road, main road, Castle Town Bear, Kenmare Link. So I'm gonna cross straight over and that's it. We're off the road now onto the trail. Waterfall. Do love a good bit of cascading water. Look at that. Oh man, what a view. Look at that. Whoo! Wow. Bog, bog, scudgy bog. Can't avoid it, going through the middle. <laughs> well, that's a half decent view. We've come over the top of the mountain pass, just about to begin our descent down into the Glenitchikin Valley. And you can see the two lakes either side, the river in between, and we get to walk down there. It's pretty exciting. Wow, that's a long cattle grid. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go down the middle. Do, do, do. <laughs> Help. As the path leveled out between the two lakes, I spotted a sign for yet another unmissable archeological site just off the trail. Goodness me, look at the location of this. This then is the Urach Stone Circle, situated between the two lakes with the Inchikin waterfall coming down at the head of the lake there. What an unbelievable location. And there's one, two, three, four, five stones here. But the interesting thing is this one, this megalith here, stands three meters tall. I mean, it towers above me, it's huge. Must have been such a task to get this in place. And no doubt it is exactly where the people wanted it to be, the exact precise location but we're just surrounded by this amphitheater of mountains with the two lakes either side. It's really a very, very special place. It's quite atmospheric actually. And I feel very privileged to have it to myself at the moment. Leaving behind the stone circle, the path skirted around the edge of Loch Inchikin, its surface rippling gently in the wind. On the opposite bank stood Urach Wood, which has been protected since 1982 and contains remnants of an ancient Irish oak woodland. Purple sheep! <laughs> they are friendly! What's going on? Hey purple sheep! They're very cute! Hi! <laughs> Just stopped for a banana and it looks like the weather's clearing. There's blue sky up ahead and the cloud is lifting. Yes, the sunglasses work. Ooh, we have a boardwalk. That's what we like to see. Clearly the people in County Kerry can't stand for bog as much as the people in County Cork because we have another boardwalk. Again, they're not very long, but it's something. And it's a start to making this route way more accessible to people, I believe. The bog is something people don't like, unfortunately. It's not for everybody. But having boardwalks or slabs, yes, it makes the landscape feel a lot less remote, but it does make it more accessible to people and brings tourism into the area. People doing the bear away, enjoying the scenery, hopefully extending the tourist season as well because the winter light in Ireland, I've heard, is something to experience. So I will definitely be back in winter. Maybe not this winter, but definitely soon. Anyway, boardwalk. Woo! 
<laughs> this must signal that we're getting close to the pass itself. Oh man, look at that. Wow, I have no words. The views north were possibly some of the best yet, overlooking Kilahau Mountain and Kenmare Bay. I soaked it all up for a while before beginning the descent down the saturated hillside. This is very precarious. Going downhill on mud like this is tricky. I've slipped a lot of times, but I'm doing good. Just got a, a long way to go yet. <laughs> on rock, you sort of put your weight on and test it and then transfer your weight and you do the same with snow. With mud, it's like you look at it and you slip over, or at least that seems to be what I'm doing. <laughs> Never mind. This is definitely where a boardwalk would be wonderful right now. Just saying, authorities. <laughs> oh my god! Help, my stick! No! Hang on. It's okay, we're good. Um, what's the safest way? Probably over there. Whoa, I just nearly stepped on this dude. What caterpillar is that? I've obviously absolutely terrified it. I have no idea what species of caterpillar this is or what it's going to turn into, but it's really striking. It's little pink tufts and orange spots. And of course it's green, which blends in perfectly to this environment. Let's put them back. Some old sheep pen thing here. I don't know a lot about that, except it's circular and made of rocks. Eventually, I left the mud behind, reaching firmer ground, an achievement worthy of celebrating. Or so I felt, at least. Yes, there it is. Right, road, let's go. Tarmac, join us. Oh, I'm very happy. I relaxed into the next few kilometers of road walking, enjoying the sound of birdsong and relative tranquility of the area. And, of course, I kept my eye open for red squirrels though I didn't see any this time. We have a main road. So this is it. This would take us all the way to the b, &B. I know that because I was just checking the notes. <laughs> I realized a little too late that the way actually follows a path running parallel to the main road, which seemed a lot more sensible than my situation. My guide notes say that there's a shortcut on this road and I can't believe it, I've actually found it. So I'm staying at Water's Edge b, &B So I need to go up through here. So we get to leave the main road behind, which is fantastic because that was a bit hairy and follow this soggy path up to the B&B. Oh, actually they've graveled it. That's very sensible. <laughs> Come say hi. Hey. <laughs> Wherever you are, I love you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> this is where we are tonight. Look at it. It's a beautiful place. Fantastic views over the shore, but I'm gonna go get a cup of tea. You know me, that's my priority. Ah, oh, I drank my tea and now I'm going for a walk into Kenmare. So it's about half an hour, a couple of kilometers, I think. Um, so this is gonna be really interesting though because <laughs> I'm in flip flops. I just really don't wanna be wearing my boots. They're so, so wet and all of my socks stink. I think I should probably just wash them actually. Uh, but never mind. anyway, so we're going to Kenmare. We've got to go over the concrete bridge that goes over the river Kenmare. It was built in 1939 and it replaced what's believed to have been the first suspension bridge built in Ireland in the 1800s, early 1800s. Nowadays it is just concrete, but we're going to walk over that and that will take us into the town. The name Kenmare means head of the sea, referring to the head of Kenmare Bay. The town was laid out in an X shape in the 18th century by William Petty, a local landlord, who later became Prime Minister of Britain, and in 1783 concluded the Treaty of Paris, which ended the War of American Revolution. Nowadays, the town is a bustling place, filled with colourful buildings and a cheerful atmosphere. It was also very busy with traffic something that took me by surprise, having just emerged from the solitude of the mountains. I went to check out the Holy Cross Church, which was consecrated in 1864. 
then tried on some tweed hats, which proved to be great fun. I concluded my day by checking out the music maker statues on the shore of the Kenmare River. The musicians looked really content, and that was exactly how I was feeling. It had been a brilliant penultimate day on the trail. Twenty-seven kilometres today should be very scenic. Once again, overcast but perfectly cool for me. Let's join the road. Let's get some miles in. There's the bridge. Looking good this morning. The woodlands alongside the road were alive with bird songs that saw my spirit soar. I made fast progress, soon crossing over the River Sheen, which is notable for its salmon population, attracting fishermen from all around Ireland each year. We seem to be walking along the same route as the Sheen Valley Heritage Trail, which is quite interesting actually, but I mean, to my right we keep getting the occasional views of the mountains through the shrubs here, through the trees, and I must say it feels kind of weird right now to not be in them. I know that later today we'll be much more immersed in the mountains, we'll be entering back into the Kaha Range, but right now it just feels a bit strange. I'm like, hmm. Would I rather have wet feet right now and be in the mountains? Or would I rather have fast walking on the road where I can just think and take it all in? I'm not sure. <laughs> Can't believe I'm gonna say this, but I think wet feet might be <laughs> winning. <laughs> Never mind. The long stretch of road walking could have been boring, but once again, I immerse myself in the beauty of the wildlife all around. From the sound of rivers tumbling alongside to the colors of the wildflowers in the hedges, it was always rewarding to take the time to notice the beauty in the ordinary. How big is this fern? Looks like it should be in a rainforest. <laughs> Mind you, given how much I'm sweating right now, it's so, so humid. I'm not too surprised that that's there. <laughs> Sheen Valley Heritage Trail. Still heading on. Bear away. When I get back home, I'm probably gonna be like walking around just day to day and be like, where's the yellow signs? Where do I go? What do I do? Where's my purpose? <laughs> All right. The route passed by the Benane Heritage Park, a protected area containing more than 250 archeological sites. So there's a nice little loop that anyone can come and do, get views all around, the stone circles, all sorts of different things to see. So I expect that would be quite a nice sort of afternoon place to have a look around. Cool, check this place out. Some stepping stones. I don't need to go across them, but I want to. I don't quite believe it, but we are pretty much halfway on today's walk so far. And it is nearly 12 o'clock. I've just been plodding along really. Trying not to get run over by bikes and looking for red squirrels. <laughs> it's basically been my morning, how about you? <laughs> See that? Cycle in progress today. No, really. <laughs> wow, that's cool. Look, you can see where the water's worn away the rock. Gosh, it's been so much higher than it is now. Leaving the Sheen Valley Heritage Trail now. This is it. So we'll pick up the path in a moment. I believe I can just about see the track that we're going to be taking up the mountain pass. So basically what we're doing is we're working our way between Esk Mountain, which is over there, and then Baraboy Mountain, which is slightly higher to the left there. So we're going through the pass between them. And the actual track that we'll be following is, believe it or not, the old road, the link road between Kenmare and Glen Gareth. It's unbelievable that people used to like come up here, horse and cart. Can you imagine what that traverse would be like if the weather was in? Pretty miserable, that's for sure. Haha, -ha. there's one style I don't have to climb. <laughs> that's good news. It's really so cool to be on such a historical road. You can imagine who's journeyed along here, what reasons they were making the traverse between the two towns. 
Oh, I love letting my imagination run wild when it comes to history. It felt amazing to take on the climb, which was the first of the day. My legs felt strong and my heart powerful, and I felt utterly connected to the landscape I was walking through. A feeling that left me in the need for a jig. Okay, I promised you I would play my tin whistle. This is the ultimate vulnerability for me. But there's heather around me, there's mountains around me. I thought what better place to break this out. So I've been practicing a little bit on the trail, not very much to be honest. And I haven't played it for about four or five years before. Uh, so there we go. I can remember one jig, well a few jigs, but one that's a little bit longer. So I'll just go around with it a couple of times. I don't know what it's called, but it goes something like this. I played the tin whistle in Ireland. That is one of my life goals ticked off. There we go. <laughs> right, back to hiking. <laughs> the trail pressed on along muddy tracks and winding trails, passing a random erratic boulder, and then on into the Glendariff Nature Reserve, a clear sign that my journey along the Barrow Way was soon to come to a close. I've come down to this little beach here. This is actually the Glengareth River running down alongside me. Um, I wanted to sort of conclude my walk here because when I get into Glengareth itself, it's going to be busy with the cars and the people right on that junction where I officially started my trail. Um, and actually, you know, it's been the peace and the solitude that has struck me about the Barrow Way, the tranquility of the walking. And right here is a very tranquil spot. It's beautiful with the, the river flowing by me. And I've been thinking a lot during today, I've had a lot of thinking time about the lessons I've learned from this trail and I really do think it's to do with mindset. Now I'm still sort of dwelling on this but to begin with on the trail obviously I was struggling a lot with my mental health and that's very much a reflection of what's going in, on inside me as opposed to outside me. Yes it was boggy and it was wet and so I was basically taking all of those challenges, the weight on my back, the bog underneath my feet, the climbs that I had to do, everything was just a challenge, it was an obstacle, it was putting me down because I let it and that's how I was approaching it mentally. But when the bubble kind of burst and when I gave myself permission to say, no, do you know what, I'm committed to this trail, I'm going to complete this trail, if that means I need to, you know, take some weight off my back, if I need to adapt, then I will do that. Um, and then the bubble burst and suddenly all of those challenges and obstacles became opportunities and I was laughing in the face of them. They brought me joy because I was overcoming them, the, the sense of adversity and then the flourishing that came on the other side of that. I just wonder how often we give up when we're so close to succeeding and what is success I don't know I mean life is a journey you know there's no end to this every day every trail there's something to learn if we're open to that and I really think I've just been reminded about how I can approach things and as I say the challenges and the obstacles becoming opportunities and just allowing my true nature to flourish in the face of them to be actually okay fine this bog is pretty rotten the weight is pretty heavy but what happens if I just keep going if I push one more step one more step one more step what's on the other side of that open those doors the next corner around the trail I just I just love how the trail is such a metaphor for life and you know, I feel kind of sad that the bear away is over. The end of the trail is always such a sacred time for me. I get quite sort of sensitive because you've just gone from this immense journey every single day, getting up, walking, experiencing all the different things that you experience, your senses are alive, and then suddenly it's back to day to day. It's just different, you know, and 
is being able to bring the lessons that you learn on the trail, the things that cause you to thrive and, and apply those to your day-to-day -day life. And I think that's just what's gonna help me and us, those of us who are within this backpacking community to, to flourish and be the best that we can be. And that's what this is about ultimately. This isn't just about doing a walk for walk's sake. This is about growing. You never come out of a trail the same person, whether it's been easy or whether it's been hard, you will have transformed in some way or another. And you know, I just want to give a huge thank you to Hillwalk Tours for opening up the opportunity for me to come to Ireland. I can't believe I never considered coming here. It's just never been sort of on my list in my mind. And now I don't want to leave. I just I want to change my flight home and just stay here. It's beautiful. The people that I've met, the smiles and the warmth in their greetings has just been unbelievable. And of course the landscapes, as we mentioned, the solitude, the peace, the freedom in those hills that transport you back in time. This has been a walk, a journey that I will never forget. I will treasure this for a very, very long time. My walk around the Ring of Bearer. So as always guys, thank you so much for walking and journeying with me. Perhaps you're not quite as muddy, but maybe you've been inspired to do this walk. I would strongly encourage you to check it out. If you don't walk it, of course, there's a cycle route. And if you can't be physically active, no worries. You can always hop in a car, hop on the local transport and experience it one way or another, because get yourself to the Ring of Bearer. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. You will not regret it. So guys, I hope you enjoy your next adventure and I'll see you next time. Wherever we may be, whatever trail we'll be walking, I know it'll be absolutely wonderful. You know how we always finish? Stay wild. That's what it's all about. Getting outside, spend more time in the wild. That is it. Me done. Oh, hang on. Glen Garris that way. Let's go. Come on. Right to the end. All the way. Last kilometre. <laughs> the final few kilometres along the road into town were rather anticlimactic, but I didn't mind so much. I was overflowing with joy at having come away with such a treasured experience and valuable learnings, and my heart raced with excitement as I soon spotted the sign where I had begun my adventure many days ago. Well, here we are. There's the sign. This is officially where I began my Bear Away journey, and this is where I'm ending it. That's it. The Ring of Bearer is complete on this busy junction in Glengariff. Can't quite believe it, but I've already been thinking. What about the Ring of Kerry? Will you be joining me? Hope to see you there. I made my way through the village back to the B&B, wearing my mud stains with pride. The next day, I treated myself to a trip to Garnish Island, renowned for its gardens and architecture. On the boat trip out, we spotted a number of seals, which was a real treat. And then, on the island itself, I was transported into another world and completely taken aback by the beauty. What a way to end an adventure. Ireland had well and truly won my heart. Mm -hmm.